Okay, uh, let's get started. This is the Java EE course. And uh, last week we did uh, JDBC. Okay, very good. So this week we're going to do UMI, uh, U, U, yeah, RMI, excuse me. Uh, UDP is what I meant to say. I, I, com I combined UDP with RMI, made it U UMI. Uh, what I meant to say was UDP, TCP, and RMI. Uh, which is the theme of today's topics. Um, but before I get into that, I want to take a few minutes and go over the assignments uh, so that you know what you're working with in terms of uh, uh, the course requirements. Um, so if you haven't noticed, on the bhacker.com website, under the assignments link, we have one, two, three, four, five, six assignments. And we have over here with the projects, we have uh, one, two, three, four projects. Okay, so I've downloaded them all, and I've got them locally in a directory here. So let's go take a look real quick. Uh, let's see. And assignment number one is the one we had just talked about last week. So right now is actually when you can start doing assignments because I've covered the material so far. And uh, what you're going to do for this is you're going to actually have to go to the website and download the support files that go along with it. If you see for project number one, it has a project data file bunch of data um, that you can use to uh, insert into an, an SQL table, you know, SQL queries to insert data into the table. Got a little readme first here that goes through the install of the JDBC drivers, but everything we talked about uh, last week in terms of the lecture that we were having um, goes through the same, this is the same readme file from last week's lecture. And then this goes through um, everything you need to know to set up the database as well as uh, input some stuff in here um, install, well, you know, you have to go through the tutorial videos to figure out how to install uh, Oracle. You may do the assignment in Oracle, or you may do it in MySQL, or you may do it in anything you want. So you're not required to do it in Oracle. Um, the, some of the lecture examples demonstrate it using MySQL. Um, I demoed it using Oracle, so it's your choice. Uh, what you're doing in this project is you're creating a database for online movie website. And you're going to use a relational database management system. Uh, Oracle or MySQL, your choice. And you're going to populate the database and connect to it using a Java client program, which is what we kind of did last week, actually. And the database uh, will contain information about movies, so you can uh, sell this valuable information to your customers. Here's some, here are some steps to accomplish for this particular project. Step number one, create the database. Call it MovieDB. Uh, for use, uh, you can also use the, the HR database in Oracle. You don't have to create a full database for it. You can create this database, or you can create this, call it, uh, you know, call it the HR if you want, object. It doesn't really matter what you call things, is what I'm saying, or where, where they're located. Create the relational relations of the scheme provided below. I'll go to that in a few minutes. And use the provided data to SQL file to populate the tables. You may or may not be able to use that, depending upon the date formats and the columns that you create and the attributes that you put on the columns. The data that was in the data.sql, there's a lot of data in there actually, you don't have to use it all either. You could put like maybe five rows in there. You could populate the table with your own data. Uh, because that was actually originally written for SQL, MySQL, and uh, the dates are going to be wrong. So you're going to have to modify that file and there's a lot of entries in that file. So long story short, you're probably going to end up populating it with your own data. So. I should probably say you can use instead of use. It's not required that you use that data file. Uh, you might need to change the format of the data SQL insert statements to match the table configuration that you've created. Because remember, you're inserting into tables you've created. Uh, see the readme file for more information on that. That's, uh, I have that out there. And then you're going to write the JDBC program that provides the text-based user interface to support the following queries using JDBC uh, to talk to the server and return the results. So in the actual development effort, uh, functional look and fill requirements, you know, they're up to you. Um, they're, they're not being specified. You can, you can do your own GUI, or if you want to do a GUI, you don't have to do a GUI. It can be a total command line prompt interface. Um, the scheme itself, here it is. So you're creating a movie database. So we've got movies, stars, and stars in movies, genres, genres in movies, and customers. And uh, these are the names of the tables over here. These are the attributes that are going to be in the tables and these are some of the things about the table. So you can use the uh, Oracle GUI interface that I showed you last week to do the 
manual creation of the tables and population of the table, and you can put, you know, actually you can use that GUI to populate the table with some sample data as well. You don't have to put a lot in there, maybe about, you know, five or so movies. Or five or so, you know, in each, each table maybe. You want to have something to query, so. So after you create all the database stuff, then you're going to write the Java program and provide the following functionality. And again, it can be a console-based application or a GUI, but you don't have to have a GUI. It can be totally console-based. So when the program runs, the user is asked for their username and password. You actually have that already in the get examples I gave you last week. Uh, the database user login information, not the password uh, in the above scheme. So if all goes well, the employee is granted access to the database or to the program. And, uh, you know, we have a, you know, a login or, you know, just a main screen that appears. If not, uh, you know, perhaps the, the database is not present, the database has a long password or something, you should print, uh, you know, the exception that occurs out onto the screen. Uh, so if you do the exception handling, you follow the login example that I gave you in the JDBC 1, 2, and 3 examples we went over last week, you're set because you can just use that essentially as a base. And you're really welcome actually to use those examples in your program. That's perfectly fine. So then uh, you're going to provide a menu that allows the employee to print to the screen the movies featured in a given star, movies featured for of a given star, you know, which, which movies are the stars featuring in. All the movie attributes should appear you know, labeled and neatly arranged. Yeah, you're just basically printing the results out to the screen. I already showed you how to do that one as well. That's in the examples. And the star can be queried via the last first name or the last name or the ID. Actually, we saw that too. <laughs> so, first name and last name means the star should be uh, queried for both first name and last name. So, uh, print a screen. Uh, print to the screen a nice, neat list of the genres of the movies. You know, basically, you're printing to the screen all the information that's in that database. Um, insert a new star into the database functionality. Associate an existing star with a particular movie. You basically are changing things or updating the tables. Inserting a customer into the database. Uh, do not allow an insert of a customer if the credit card does not exist in the credit card table. You know, is there a credit card table up here? Uh, customers, sales, credit cards. Here we go. Credit card table. You can make all that information up. It doesn't have to be like real long numbers or anything. And let's see, delete a customer from the database, delete a movie from the database. In the case where there's a requested task cannot be accomplished, print a clear, crisp message to the screen. You know, do not just pass along some Java exception. But, you know, hey, couldn't insert, couldn't delete or something. So try to add, if you can, try to add some information to be printed to the screen when the exception is caught. And the examples I'm going to, that I've given you already, um, print the exceptions to the screen. So you can change that to print anything you want, actually. You, don't have to print, you can print the exception if you want, but also give some better, you know, better user error control. Uh, the deliverables, all the source code, um, the, jo the, the, the Java files, any SQL files that you're going to use, if you don't follow this pattern up here. If you're following this pattern, I already have this database built, so I can just run your program with my database, and it's going to work just fine. Um, if you follow this. If you don't follow this, give me the SQL code, because I'll need to create your database if I'm going to test it at all. Um, and um, you're probably not going to have any make files or anything like that. Um, so, Or if you make use of ant or build for your project, which you're probably not going to do. You're probably just going to have a Java, .java file. Don't need the .class files, just the .java files, because I'll compile it myself. Uh, and uh, I'll run it with my drivers, So, because I'll need to change the code anyway to meet whatever database I'm well, so if you write it for SQL, my SQL, I'm going to run it on Oracle. So, and I'm going to run it with this, these tables here. So, long story short, it's actually pretty easy because we went all through all of this stuff last week. This was the example number one, two, and three that we went over. So, you're taking that, and those examples, by the way, are still out here. This is an example of the JDBC one, JDBC two, and JDBC three uh, that are on the website. Those are the examples. This is the SQL file. And uh, here's the readme file that's referred to in the assignment description. So it's fairly straightforward, hopefully, and it should be, uh, it's the first one of the projects. It is worth 10 points. Each one of the projects are 10 points each. So we have 40% with these four projects. Questions on project number one? Hmm? 
Mm, okay, good. Maybe do, we can always, you know, revisit as we go through. But it gives you something to work on. And project number one you should be able to do, actually, no problem. Project number two is RMI, and that is what we're going to work on today, actually. And, well, today and probably next week. Today we'll probably hit UDP and TCP, and then next week we'll do RMI, uh, just to break it out a little bit, uh, because we're not going to... We're going to spend here four hours probably, so let me zoom on uh, in on this so you can see it a little bit better. Uh, so this assignment might make a little bit more sense when we get done uh, next week, the next week's lecture, but what you're doing is you're building an RMI program, and the assignment will require you to write, first, to write a first very simple server, server, server service that works with a distributed system. And I'll be going over that, uh, probably the source code next week. If you want to look ahead, actually, the weekend section of the course already had this done for them. And you can see the RMI engine working and everything by looking at the weekend videos, actually. <coughs> so it will require the use of RMI. And the service that you're writing will implement the following interface. And here's the interface. You don't know what an interface is yet, but uh, that's the interface to it. <laughs> so, so it extends remote. We're going to get a name, get a grade. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of a name and a grade kind of grading program. That's what this is. So a string will return get name method, um, which should be your name. And another string that will return get grade, a grade associated with the name, sort of like a grade book. And then a shutdown, gracefully shut down, this, down the service. Um, and then it's highly recommended that you follow the example and tutorials at this particular link. If I press on the link, it will hopefully take me to... Hopefully in the background, yes, I am opening it up. There we go. Uh, the Java tutorials, and this one says trail RMI. And uh, here's, a, you know, I'm going to give you one actually in class, um, probably next week. But uh, it'll run through a sample program, writing it, writing the interface, loading the interface, loading the server, RMI server, setting, uh, setting properties correctly, so policy files and stuff like that. But nice little tutorial, so the link still works, and uh, so you go through the steps, and uh, note on the security manager itself that you're going to have to set a security policy, so in the section create and install a security manager, there's a following line, an RMI application could define the use of another security manager class. Hmm. Well, don't be concerned with the version numbers in 1.2, use a policy file that grants permission, so... We're actually using a policy file. This is the older way of doing it. Depending upon, if you're not working with the current version of Java, if you're not working with, I have 1.7 that actually uses a policy file. Earlier versions used a security manager object instead. So they are my change between the versions. So just as a heads up, if you are looking at one of the, or working with one of the previous versions, you're going to follow different instructions to set the security. So for a short explanation of uh, policy files, you can go to this URL here, installing an RMI security manager, which I believe is loading. It is loading. Very good. 10-minute solutions. Uh, let's see. Not here anymore. Okay, so this link is broken. Let's take a look at this other link down here. The link down here appears to be broken. Let's see if permissions, well, this is old, which is probably why. Let's see if the permissions in the Java 2 is actually going to work for us. It will. So the outdated, older version, the link is no longer good, but you're not probably going to be using it anyway. So I probably should just remove that. But the link for setting the permissions in Java <coughs> actually does work. But I will also be going over this in class as well when we run through the RMI example. So you'll have a working RMI program that you can use as an example for this particular project. Uh, we have some tips and tricks at the end here. <coughs> so the good news is that the coding part of the assignment has been completed in a short amount of time, hopefully. Uh, the bad news is the bumps and the things, you know, the marshalling errors and the remote exceptions and things you're going to run into until you actually get it figured out. So, you, in fact, you can probably see from the weekend video, the first time I ran it, I didn't have my class path set, and it actually didn't run for me. So I actually had to, actually had to change and run it all from the same directory in order for it to work correctly. Uh, so that's going to be the challenging part. The source code part of it is really easy. You know, it's just a name and a grade. It's just data being returned from the server to the client, essentially, or to the one object to another object. 
And uh, I'll be talking about RMI um, maybe as close as today's lecture, but probably next week. So I'm going to go through UDP and TCP today. Questions about assignment number two? No? Okay, let's move on to assignment number three then. Good old assignment number three. Well, we haven't even hit any part of this concept yet, but just to give you an overview of what it is. This one's actually kind of easy. It's a JSP assignment for which we're going to create a simple website using HTML, JSP, and serverless technologies. And serverless is going to come after RMI in the next couple weeks. So it's going to consist of three pages. You're going to have a, it's almost like Hello World. It's really easy. You're going to have an HTML page called the index.html. Okay, so you can call it anything you want. You don't have to call it index. But if you load it, it'll come up first when you go to your server. And it's going to print an attractive little message that says, hello, enter, you know, press enter, <laughs> or click on a link, say enter. So it contains an enter link. And then when the enter link is pressed, a JSP page, so you're going to have a JSP, you're going to have enter.jsp, so JSP page. So, and this page is going to be a printing of the time, the date, as well as the URL string being invoked. And uh, this is not really dynamic yet. It's just a JSP page, just so you can create one. And it should generate a form consisting of two input boxes and a submit button. So on the form, you're gonna on the page, you're gonna put like a simple form, and the form data should be submitted uh, using the POST, uh, which is the default HTTP interface to send. And uh, I'll be talking about all this stuff as we get closer, and I'll have a JSP example as well as we get a little closer. Uh, this is further down the road. The server, so we're going to have a form servlet. We're going to create a servlet for this, an easy one. And it's going to be uh, loaded up in a server. And we're going to run it from the, the JSP page. So on the client side, they're going to go to the HTML. It's going to hit the JSP. It's going to go to the servlet. It's going to run the servlet. And it's going to send information back through JSP, back through the HTML, essentially. Uh, which is the concept behind JSP and servlets in terms of what we're going to accomplish here. So the servlet form <laughs> reads the submitted data from the JSP, interpreting the two uh, values. So we have a, an integer m and a number n that generates an HTML response that's going to come back. A little polite message if the text values are not valid. You know, some error checking. Put that in there. And nicely formatted table. So in the HTML, you're going to put together a table for the n and the m. So, so for example, if the user entered an m equals 4 and n is equal to 3, the resulting table should look like uh, something like this, you know, 4 by 3 multiplication table. So m, 1, 2, 3, 4, so it's n, 1, 2, 3, n, n equals 2, n equals 3, it does our little multiplication. So it's a simple little, you know, if you don't like this, you can have it do something else if you want. The functionality in this <laughs> multiplication table is really insignificant. It's just getting some data to a server to produce this table and then send it back to the HTML. And you send the HTML back to the page to have it show up on the client side. Just exercising the server, essentially. So if you wanted to do something else, like a password recovery or something, you know, send back something, you can do that if you want. But you need to be able to send at least two pieces of data. So send two pieces of data to the server, have the server do something with it, and send the results back. That's what the purpose of the assignment is. So the page doesn't have to need to contain any other links or anything like that. Um, maybe a back, you know. The user uses the back button or to reload another URL explicitly, perhaps. So here's the code to generate the above table if you're going to do the table. So it's not too bad. It's the HTML code for the table, just in case your HTML skills aren't too good. So. The functionality described above is uh, what's required for the site, and in particular, the site does not need to be beautiful. Uh, while it is a very simple site, the functionality, such as this, could not be provided with the static web pages alone because we don't actually have the functionality unless we did it like in JavaScript or something. So you don't do it through JavaScript. So what you're going to submit, you're going to create a zip file because you can only upload a zip file into the LMS. And the zip file is going to have these three components. And the three components are the index.html, the JSP page, and the Java servlet. So you're going to create all these three and going to get working together. On the bottom, of this assignment number three, which is project number three, excuse me, they have a little thing that says uh, getting started. It's a tutorial that I haven't tested in a while. I tested it about a year ago. Works with NetBeans. I like Eclipse. So if you're like NetBeans, you can use this. I'll probably demo it in class with Eclipse. 
I, so I'm probably not going to use net beans in class. So you'll have two different opportunities to learn it from two different angles if you like net beans. You can run through this. And uh, so you can uh, create a Hello World page and it basically goes through the steps. So make sure you have Tomcat uh, working. Uh, and I'll go through that in the class. We'll install Tomcat. Actually, we have a Glassfish loaded from the download of the Java EE, so we don't have to worry about the server anymore. So commands can be used for Eclipse or download NetBeans if you want to try that out. Uh, in here, you got to you know create a new project, give it a name, you know, create a new folder for it, not the local directory. Anyway, it'll go through the steps, and I'm not going to go through it right now, but you can read through it on your own to create a little Hello World. JSP page and then creating a JSP page. So if the tutorial down here, and you can also find other ones online, is going to walk you through the steps essentially. So although it might seem like a oh, big complicated thing, it's actually you're given a lot of help and support for it. So you can follow the tutorial here, or I'm also going to demonstrate it in class as we get closer. As soon as we get done with RMI, the next subject is JSP and servlets. So. The last project for this course is an easy one, actually. It's freedom of choice. And you might actually decide to use today's technology, uh, which I'm going to discuss in a few minutes, the UDP and the TCP examples. Uh, but this one here is going to have you pr provide and create a network program of any protocol you want. So you could probably you know, experiment with a client server if you wanted to. So an assignment, the student will write a simple network client server program. So the server has a very simple job. It launches a rocket ship into outer space. <laughs> so the server's going to launch a rocket ship. The client connects to the server through any of certain ports. So you can use a port abstraction. I'm going to show you that today. The server waits for the message from the client. Uh, the client then sends a message, <coughs> sends the server a text message called launch. And then once the server receives the message, it does a little countdown, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So it launches the server. You know, so basically, the client's connecting to the server. The server says, oh, client connected. OK, launch a, <clears throat> launch a spaceship, or I mean, a, what is this? a rocket ship. And then do a countdown, and then blast off, and zoom, rocket's off. OK, and then send it back to the client. Say, hey, your rocket launched. It's just like, hello, world. Actually, I'm going to show you an example today that's going to do this. I'm not going to do a countdown with a rocket ship, but you can see it's just messages printed to a screen. Instead, this is going to say, hey, I got this message from you. So client sends a message to the server. server says, hey, look what I got from you. you know, so stupid stuff. But it demonstrates the concept that there was a connection. So you can use any type of interface that you want, any type of protocol. In terms of the server, you must be compatible with handling multiple clients simultaneously. We'll see that today with the UDP and TCP also provide simultaneous connectivity if you want to do it that way. And you can use whatever port to listen to, if you, whatever configuration you want. You don't actually to use a server. You can actually use a port-to-port -port connectivity. You don't have to do it through Apache or anything. Or you can uh, play around. This is your opportunity to create yet another RMI application if you want. You can have this done through RMI. You can actually use JSP for this as well if you wanted to. So your choice in the protocol. You can read through the server requirements. The client requirements. The client might be a web page, if that's the case, if you're doing it through JSP or through Tomcat or something. And uh, you can read through this on your own to sort of uh, get a feel for it. Any questions on the fourth project? Okay, moving right along. So we have four projects, and the four projects are worth 10 points each for 40% of your grade. All of this stuff is due on May 1st. So this is February something, February, March, April. You got two, a couple months to accomplish all this. These are the hardest ones. Not so bad. If you're just starting out, you want to do assignment number one. Assignment number one is the easiest assignment on earth. Assignment number one. Let's talk about assignment number one. Assignment number one, the easiest assignment on earth, is about refreshing your Java skills. So the purpose of the assignment is to brush up your Java programming skills. That's really easy. So this is the first one you're going to want to do to brush up your Java skills. So you're going to need to install the Java JDK. OK. You don't actually need the E for this one, but you're going to want to install the EE version because you're going to need it for everything else in the course. You can't do the RMI without it. You can't do the servlets without it. So you're going to need something. So 
Uh, actually, you can do the service servlets without it. You can't do the RMI without it. But you eventually got to install other stuff for servlets. So it's better to install the EE because then you'll get Glassfish and you'll have everything you need to be testing everything. So you can write four small little Java programs. It doesn't test your object-oriented skills. It's testing your programming skills. So the first one is writing a program that takes your first name and last name as command line arguments to the program and displays the first name and last name on a separate lines. The aim of this is to understand these command line arguments because a lot of the programs that you're writing are taking command line arguments. In fact, we'll see today with the UDP and TCP, we're taking command line arguments like the port, the host, <laughs> the string, you know, the string that you're going to send back and forth. So it's not a bad idea to know how to do that. The second assignment is going to look at understanding the if, else, and constraints flow control. So you're going to write a program that calculates the total wages based on the number of hours worked. So the wages are calculated at a rate of 8.25 per hour. That's pretty low these days. It should be like $10 an hour. I don't know what minimum wage is now. Um, less than 40 hours or 1.5 standard rate for greater than 40 hours. Long story short, you're going to use a integer parse int. So a lot, a lot of what we're doing when we send information back and forth between clients and servers is we're taking a string. We need to change it into an integer. In fact, you're going to find that is the case in the uh, one night where we're adding stuff up, doing multiplication. You're going to have a string. You have to parse it to an integer to do the multiplication stuff to it, or a double or something, or to a float. So this is nothing more than an exercise in look at, looking at how to convert the data from strings to numbers uh, and understanding the if-else, stuff like that. So converting a string to an integer, converting numbers from hours uh, from the command line to integers. There's four little programs part of this here. And uh, the second one here is write a program, uh, excuse me, the third one, write a program to take students' grades as an input argument, print the comments as follows. If it's 100, you're going to say, perfect score. If it's between 90 and 100, you're going to say, excellent. Or you're going to say, good. Or you're going to say, above average. This is going to use like a case switch scenario. So it's going to be use a switch statement, uh, understanding how to use a switch statement, which is the purpose of that particular little extra. And then the last one is uh, writing a program to print all the odd numbers between 1 and 20 using a loop. So a lot of the programs that you're writing in Java are going to be using switches you know, to determine what it is and follow some, some alternative route or put a message out to the screen depending upon what occurred. Um, or in the case of this loop, you know, to, when we look at today's examples, we'll see that the server just sits there in a loop. And so you have to you have to create these state machines in terms of looping activity where a server sits and waits on a port for incoming activity. And that's a loop, essentially, which is creating a state machine. So, The four programs that you're writing, you can do them all in one program if you want, or you can write four separate little programs. If you write four separate little programs, or if you write one, all it needs is the .java file. Just zip them all up into one file if you want and post it. This is only worth five points, so don't make this your life goal. It's only one point, one point for doing it, and one point for four different little programs that you're writing. Compared to the 10-point projects we just went over, this is half the value. So it's not meant to be uh, extremely challenging, although it's a nice exercise. It works on all, essentially the, all of the Java skills that you're going to need to write the programs for the rest of the class. Questions about assignment number one. <laughs> so that's probably the hardest assignment. Assignment number two. You're going to love this one. Eh, maybe not. <laughs> assignment number two is actually, although you might say, she just said this was the hardest assignment. Now, this one looks pretty evil, too. I'm giving you this one today. <laughs> this one, you're going to write a client server. This one's going to be in UDP or TCP. Well, we're going to see both of them work today. And I'm going to give you some sample code that you're going to use for this assignment that's going to do it for you. You just have to basically go through the routine of changing it to match this assignment requirement. Although it looks hard, it really isn't. It's actually kind of easy. So write two versions of the following program using UDP and TCP. And you're going to need to submit four files. You have a, a server, a client, a server, a client for two programs. And keep them separated, actually, because it's easier. You don't want to put all in one file. So. You don't want to put both clients, because one of them is going to use TCP, the other one's going to be using UDP. And so it's going to be a little bit difficult to switch back and forth in one program, <laughs> unless you put a menu up at the beginning. So, uh, See the examples on the class website, to, uh, which is going to be 
in the assignments directory. Let's go back to assignments. Here we go. Oh, well, all right. It's going to be. Let's take a look at the lectures for a minute. Here it is. It's lecture number four. Make note of that if you're looking for it. The file that you're going to be looking at. I don't have the status on the bottom of the screen. Uh, let's see. Is this one here? It's yeah. It's scode.zip. I'll be demoing this today actually. This goes along with lecture four that I'm going to be covering as soon as I get done reviewing the assignments. This is the code that's going to help you with assignment number two. It's not actually listed next to the assignment number two. It's in with the lectures, with the PowerPoints. Um, and then if you're curious, this introduction to JWC and MySQL introduction, like, there's some stuff here that I went over last week is located right here as well, in terms of uh, some other examples for lecture three that we had last week. The last week is all about JDBC, lecture three. This week is lecture four, which is UDP TCP. So what we're going to do in this particular assignment for assignment number two, and uh, you're going to create a password client. It's going to be called password client or something like that, uh, which communicates with a server application, password server. So your client will ask the user for both a name and a password, and then a list of legal ones will be stored. It just When it says hard-coded, it mean, means that yeah, just create some in the program. <laughs> you know, create an array of passwords or something. Or just create a string of passwords or something and just keep it in the server. And so when the client comes back and says, is this a legal password? The server's going to say, yeah. It checks the input, compares it against the legal passwords, and says, yeah, it's legal. Or no, it's not legal. Um, so we can, we're basically just creating some minimal correspondence between the client and the server. The client will pass the information back to the server, which uh, checks it for correctness. The server will then let the client know whether the password was correct or not. The server should be set up as an application. We're going to see that today, actually, which means that all of, all of its work should be done as part of a static main function. And it should create a socket and choose something larger than 1024. We'll see that today as well. I think, you know, actually, I like to use 7777 for the server and 6666 <laughs> for the client. Don't ask me why. It was an inside joke a long time ago, but you know, 777 is lucky, right? 666 is the devil. So the devil connecting to the lucky. It's like opposites attracting. But okay. All right, you know, a lot of people put, you know, they try to put humor in the, their programming. The port selection was on purpose. Or sometimes people use their birth dates for something. I like to go with 7777 and 6666. That way I always remember what the port is. I'm trying to test it. It doesn't really matter what port you create, actually. There's an unlimited supply, as long as it's above a certain part. Uh, the other thing you'll need to do is also, if you're running with antivirus software, I'm going to test this on a Mac, so I'm never going to have a problem. But Windows people who have firewalls, and sometimes antivirus software blocks ports and stuff, and all that... Microsoft security crap that you have loaded on your computer if you're working on a Microsoft system uh, is going to need to be disabled or configured to allow you to actually use the functionality of your computer. So if you've got a Mac, but you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. But uh, if you're running this on a Windows computer and it's not working, just start disabling the security stuff and hopefully it'll start working for you. Uh, yeah, not, not as much as security need on the Mac side. So. When the client makes a contact, uh, it sets up a stream. We're going to talk about streams and data packets, actually, today in the lecture as it starts. Um, transmits a name and password. Uh, no such name exists. Then it's going to come back with an incorrect name or come back with an incorrect password or correct password. You can probably figure out the functionality. Client sending a name and a password. It's going to check the name, check the password. All hard-coded. It doesn't have to do any calculations. It doesn't have to do any checks at all. And you can put test data, you know, obviously put test data in there. So, so user A, password B, <laughs> goes in and says, A, B, okay, good, you're here. Or no, we can't find you in the system because user A's password is C and not B or A or whatever it happens to be. So, user then sends a message back to the client letting it know that uh, 
you know, whatever information it found. So note that there's a, a lot of possible exceptions that might occur. In fact, we'll see them today in my examples. So make sure that the server detects all of them, prints a diagnostic message using a system out. So it's a command line console text-based application, as we're going to see. Questions about assignment number two? I know. It's like, well, to actually, assignment number two you can probably do after today's lecture. And project number one you can probably do as well. And assignment number one you can probably do. So you got tons of work to start out with. You're going to love three, four, five, and six. Here's why you're going to love it. This is three. One, two, five questions. So let me just give you a couple of heads up on what, what the expectation is. It's regurgitation and research. Some of the information can be found in the lecture notes. Some of it can be found on the internet. You're going to write a response of a minimum of 100 to 150 word response for each one of the following questions. That's why I say you're going to love this. It's easy. So this is the easy part. So one question worth one point each, five questions, five points for the entire assignment. All the assignments are only worth five points, even the UDP TCP one. No, okay, so the people who don't like programming are going to love this part. People who like the programming are going to hate this part because this is kind of tedious. They're going to go, ah, this is like busy work. It is. Um, so I'm going to give you, uh, after, after the RMI, we go into TCP, IP, well, no, excuse me, we go into IP, and IP4 and IP6. So one of the lectures is actually going to answer that question for you, or you can find it on the Internet. The difference between UDP and TCP you can answer today probably. The ARP is going to be in the same lecture as the IP4 or IP6. IP diagrams, that's going to be today's lecture, actually. And uh, Internet Control Protocol, this is going to also be in the IP lecture. So this is all on IP technology. You're answering, hopefully not by cutting and pasting, so do not cut and paste from the Internet. Actually write the answers in your own words. You're not being graded on punctuality and spelling and your use of the English language. It's the content of your response that you're being graded on. So not the quality of the response. All right. so what, are your, what is it that you're saying is that is what is important? Assignment number four is the same kind of drill, same thing, except for it's going through the concept of transactions and the acid test, and all of these things come out of the lectures. So as you go through, if you can't find the answer to something, you can probably find it in one of the lectures I covered. <laughs> so this is a little further down the road. I'll be talking about design. In fact, this is when we start with the JSP and the servlet stuff. I'll be talking about the concept of the transaction because we'll look at transaction management through a, you know, a servlet type of environment, stuff like that. But it's the same requirements as before answering 100 words. 100 words is like a paragraph or something. You don't have to have exactly 100 words. You're going to have like 85 words, you know, as long as they're good words. You know, <laughs> so. Quality, not quantity. Uh, number five is the same concept over again. Number six is also the same concept over again. But number five here's got uh, JSP. You know, explain how JSP works. You can actually go over if you want the 150 word count. You just don't want to go under too far under 100. 70, 75 is kind of pushing it, but you know, see if you can get 100 words in there. Um, model view controller, another concept that we'll be talking about later on, the job of the servlet, job of JSP, how JSP fits into real world applications. So this one, number five is all on JSP, and then number six, I believe, what is number six on? Corba. Number six is a, the last topic that we're going to be discussing in the course, actually. It's going to be on CORBA, it's going to be on Java Enterprise Beans, and uh, JNDI. We're going to hit a bunch of miscellaneous topics, distributed objects as a concept, um, which is kind of like the, the last couple weeks of the course uh, towards the end. Any questions on uh, the assignments, uh, the ones I just kind of breezed through, which was number three, four, five, and six? Four. They're all worth four, five points each, so it's only 30 points, 40 points, and then we have a couple of, uh, we don't have a midterm in this course, we just have a final. So. And uh, let me just verify that real quick. We have a, one other assignment here, actually, let's zoom in and just, while I'm just summarizing everything for the course, I might as well revisit the syllabus for a second. Uh, yes, six assignments worth five points for 30, four projects worth 10 points for 40%. We do have a very small CSLO essay that I do not have available yet. Don't worry about that one. It's only like, it's extremely small point value. Here's 10%, 10 points. 
And it's probably going to be like a page that you're going to have to write towards the end. But I haven't come up with a question yet. So don't worry about that. This, all of this stuff is due on May 1st, the end of the course. Final exam, that one's going to be in class at the end of the course. And that one, the attendance is required in person for that final exam. Uh, and then I'll have a final exam review on as well as we get closer to the end of the course. Questions about the assignments? Nope, we're good. Okay, well that concludes the rudimentary summary. I'm going to actually split this video out because other people don't really need to listen to that. So the next one will actually be on UDP and TCP. <laughs> so let me stop this one.